Hi, this is Justin Kelly from 3db Labs, and today we're going to go over quite a bit. Um, I'm going to use the signal generator function inside of Scepter to demonstrate how you can start, stop recordings, tether recordings together to start at the same time. Um, so there's going to be quite a bit packed in this. If I start up Scepter, I've got <clears throat> Uh, my previous config that I just worked on a little bit and I saved it called SigGen Recording. And I'm going to do something a little bit different here. Uh, I'm going to go to the next option. And in the next option, I have underneath processing DVR. And what I did here is I selected enable DVR, told it where to store the, the, the buffer, and then how much I'm going to allocate to that. Now, if it seems like I'm jumping ahead and you're wondering what the buffer is, that is a pre-D circular buffer so that you can have the ability to not just record at the time the event happened or when you want to you know, click record, but also gives you an ability to sort of rewind uh, and go back and make an extraction post event, right? So you kind of have this like DVR, but for your pre-D. Okay, I'm going to open this up. Getting some warnings there about my maps I need to fix. Okay, so this is the SIGGEN. Uh, now again, I said we're going to go over both SIGGEN and recording, which there's quite a bit tied up in both. Uh, the SIGGEN is really useful if you are just trying to do some training or you're trying to evaluate how you would look at a certain type of signal. Uh, there's a lot of tools in here to make custom constellation plots. Uh, you know, there's a pretty good arbitrary waveform generator. So there's quite a bit here. So the SIGGEN is controlled from the SIGGEN control panel, um, which can be accessed again post from uh, the window option, SIGGEN control. And Basically, you, uh, it starts off with just one, and then to add more signals in, you just click this plus button to add in more. And you select it, and then you can minus it to make it go away. So I've got one signal selected now. It's kind of giving an overview. It's BPSK, it's a Barker 13. Um, where is it centered at relative to uh, zero, et cetera. So I'm going to add another signal in, and uh, you can see I've already selected it. I uh, wanted to select noise, white noise, the gain I want to add, and say, say active. Take that to make it active. So I got some noise in there for some realism. And then I'm going to add in a, uh, another signal. I'm going to make a pulsed signal. And there I've added in a pulsed waveform that was selecting that. Uh, going to PDW and then from PDW you can either uh, say to select from file and you can load an actual PDW file which is a pulse descriptor word and that will generate the IQ for you uh, for each burst and I told it to be 2 megs up from center I gave it a gain of 2.5 PRI PD and then for Modulation, I told it to go and be a swept uh, or a, a, uh, an LF mop, so freq linear frequency modulation on the pulse, and I gave it two megs. Um, so again, uh, quite a lot of versatility inside of the SIGGEN. You can change your sampling rate, so right now it's about 10 mega samples a second complex. And just by scrolling over this, you can increase or decrease your uh, sampling rate. And you can use this to sometimes test for very wide bandwidth signals. Now, even on my laptop, uh, you know, I can change this to say, you know, be a thousand. And it's obviously going to run very slow, uh, only at about 30 or 20 or so mega samples a second, but it will run. So if you wanted to test that out, you know, you can let it run. It won't run at real time. But it will allow you to, you know, let, let it run for a little bit, save the data off, and then process it post, uh, so you can actually generate some good test data there. Okay, so I think I'm pretty happy with that. 
And so to do recordings inside of Scepter, there are, uh, just like with most things with this software, there are multiple ways to do the same thing. So the quickest, fastest way to do the recording is in the upper right hand side of any spectrum uh, is a raw pre-D spec audio and PDW button. The difference between raw and pre-D is they're both I and Q per se. Uh, raw is going to record the samples coming off of the digitizer in the format that they were delivered to Scepter. Um, so that's going to be, you know, for example, on a, uh, on an Edis B200, that is going to be a 16 bit IQ, um, or 16 T. The pre D is going to be saved as a 32 float. Uh, there are a few receivers where both raw and pre D are going to, going to record the same thing. One of those is a signal hound SM 200. Um, the data is being manipulated by the API on the signal out and it's going to be turned into a 32 float before it's ever reached a scepter. So you're going to be recording the same format in, in that case. So Spectrum, if you hover over this, it's going to tell you what it says as well, but start Spectrum recording, that's going to just save Spectrum recording, as you would think. Audio, that's going to save out a WAV file. And then PDW, which is going to save a pulse descriptor word. Uh, now, if you're not familiar with pulse descriptor words, um, I can maybe do another video at a later time that describes what is a PDW and what goes into that. But if you're trying to look at radar, the PDW file is a very powerful uh, way to do recordings without having to record the full I and Q. Usually, though, you want to have both a PDW and an I and a uh, I and Q file. And that way, you have a sort of a roadmap to with with which to actually look for different details inside of your I and Q file. So if I click raw here, see my disk speed here on, on, my, uh, on my right went up a little bit. Click off, it's gonna go down, that all jives. Um, Pre-D would go up as well. And now just as in uh, the rest of Scepter, if I am in input spectrum and I hit raw, that is going to record the full bandwidth at that top level, right? So that is going to record this full bandwidth from here to here. Um, now to analyze any recordings you have made inside of window underneath recording database is where all your files are that you've just recorded. So here are the two files I just made, and I'm going to go ahead and clean those out because I am a little bit low on storage, and Scepter does tell you up here in the upper right-hand side what your current storage situation is. So I select those, it lets me know three selected, delete, yes, and those files are gone. Okay, so now that those are gone, let's talk about other ways to do recordings. So if I right click and drop a tuner here, I can right click on this tuner and bring up a control panel for that. I can also right click and bring up spectrum, spectrogram, and any of the other uh, plots with which I can open inside of Scepter. If I just do control panel for right now, because that's the easiest way to do it, um, you'll notice that I have another way to do recordings. So I also could have launched the, oh, I might as well do that as well. Right click, launch the spectrum. And there's the spectrogram, or rather the spectrum for this software tuner. And you can see on the right hand side, I have the same options, pre-D, spec, audio, and PDW. You'll notice the, uh, there is no raw, and there is no raw because I have placed a software tuner and I have turned this data into a 32 float in order to do that software tuner. What was that? So if I had to click pre-D there in that spectrogram, that would have been the same thing as going here and clicking pre-D and clicking record. I can see my file up here there as I start to save it. Now as I start to save it, you can see my duration is increasing, 
sample rate stays the same, frequency, number of samples, file size, and the format. Turn that off. Now file's done. Do the same thing, spectrum, audio, etc. No, no, no uh, difference there. Clicking spectrum and hitting record makes a spectral recording. Okay, now there's yet another way to do recording. So inside of window, there's an actual recorders uh, plugin. And a recorders plugin actually will allow you to see a roll up of everything that you can possibly record inside of the software. And that's going to change as a function of, of what only a few things actually active per se with regard to streams. Turn this off real quick. And if I click record here on input raw, you'll see that this lights up here and lights up down there. And you can kind of think of this as like a, a grand uh, way to tie all the different recorders together. Now, if I right click on this again and click on spectrum, you'll see that now I have some new options that just popped up there. So I now have options for input channel one. And the reason for this is that only as streams become active, can you record them. So what all can you record? Uh, so there's an option up here on the very upper right hand side that says hide inactive streams. If you select that, you'll find it does, it takes a little bit to load uh, because there are a lot of different options here. These are all of the things with which you can record. There are quite a few. Um, the easiest way to think of this is any at any step in the processing chain, you can decide to cut that as, as an actual file. Um, so, for example, if you wanted to do a nonlinear demod, uh, you can absolutely save out the spectrum and the nonlinear demod of, of that process. If you wanted to do a linear demod and take it all the way down to simple decisions, you can save off both raw and soft decisions. And that can be done both at the whole input level or at the software tuner level. And then furthermore, what you can do is you can begin to gang together these recordings. So let's say you want to record um, channel one every time you record channel two. Okay, just as a very simple example here. So again, I, uh, I'm just gonna bring up the spectrum for this, that way this becomes active. I'll just put this right here. Now I'm gonna rehide inactive streams just to kind of declutter that. And you'll see this option says sync. So if I sync channel one pre-D and I sync input channel two pre-D, uh, and you can mix and match different types, that's fine as well. If I record on one, I automatically record on the other. So they are synchronized together. So anytime I click record on one, they're both recorded. Let me start, let me tag some of these so I can clean them up after. If you haven't seen this before, the session tags allows you to embed a keyword inside of the file so that every time you make a recording, that file has that tag so that you can then filter off of those from your recording database again. So I filter these as test. I'll just delete these files again. If I do another recording, you'll see that both of these are tagged with test. And I can actually select that and that will apply a filter here. You can see I've, I use test pretty often. It will filter out all of your files that you've made Likewise, if you start typing in here, 
it will autofill based upon what it knows is already inside of the recording database. If I hit enter now, it's going to apply that filter. Okay. So <clears throat> now let's say that I want to add a feature such that every time I make a recording or I click record, my recording has a small slight buffer. So, you know, giving myself a couple of moments with which to decide to actually hit record or to let that signal go ahead. So what you can do is uh, there's a little button drop down here and I can click that drop down and you can do a timed recording, which is, uh, you know, you can actually just set that to maximum time, hit time recording. It's going to record for that many seconds or minutes. And then you have a pre-buffer duration. So if I start scrolling on that, this turns green, you can see this pre-buffer is filling up. And you can see that I'm also recording up here. So what that pre-buffer is doing is that pre-buffer is allocating um, that amount of time in storage. So it's always writing to disk, but only five seconds worth. So that if something happens, it all comes up, it goes down, whatever, you have, you know, an in number of seconds to decide to hit record. And if I hit record, what's going to happen is that my recording will have started five seconds prior to me actually hitting the button record. So now that's pretty cool. Um, but even that, that's going to be more in your use case of you don't have a lot of storage and you are trying to be smart with how much storage you have. Um, so if I go back here, I'm going to show you now the, the DVR. Okay, so I'm going to bring back up my SIGGEN controls. And I'm going to turn off the signal here and I'm going to turn back on and then turn it back off. Okay. Why did I do that? So let's say I want to make a recording of that, that on off time. That's important to me. And I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't present. We don't have the manpower to staff to dedicate to record this. So what do I do? This is, this has already happened. Well, remember earlier I, I allocated this like rewind function. So I have this scroll bar here on the left. And what that allows me to do is this blued area or grayed area is trying to tell me um, what is my current view span compared to my entire buffer, right? And I can go to the options pane here and for DVR, and essentially it's telling me I have uh, basically 10 minutes of buffer um, assigned based off of this sampling rate and a 50 gig uh, buffer size. So I can select this, left click, drag back, and kind of go back in time. Now this is, you're going to see this kind of scroll up slowly. And that's letting me know that the buffer is different than a recording. When I record, it's permanent. When I'm buffered, I'm giving myself X amount of time to decide what I want to do. So there's a couple things you can do here. I can uh, left click and zoom in. And you'll notice I get this enhance button, which is really cool. And what that's going to do is as I zoom in here, when I'm DVRing, I'm pre-calculating FFTs beforehand, right? So that as I zoom in, it's going to refresh those tiles. But I can click enhance, and what that enhances let me know is, hey, I can do a better job to recalculate. So if I say enhance, it's going to go back and it's recalculated the FFTs based upon my new zoom level. Zoom in some more, click enhance. I can actually see the individual pulses now. Now there's an option to have it auto enhance. And you might ask, well, why not always do that? And the reason why is this isn't free. You know, when you zoom in, there's a tax on your CPU. So you have to be cognizant of utilizing this feature, but it's very powerful. Okay, 
So the way I can get away with this is because this pre-D is still here. So what if I want to make a recording of this? Zoom out here. Okay. So I have a couple options here. On the left-hand side, I have this extraction mode. So I can hold down the X button, or I can click this, and I can draw a box. And now I have this feature that says extract. So if I hit extract, that's, that is going to both thin in time and subband tune in frequency that data out and cut that to file. So now, there, I mean, there's my file right there. Um, I'll load this up, click open on there. To load another instance. I can see my file there. Okay, so I can also do, this is nothing to do with recording per se, but this is the first time we've introduced the DVR function. So I can also draw a box here. And I also have this play feature. So going down the sort of processing chain, I also have a little button here that says DVR. And the processing chain is replicated from my processing chain on the entire bandwidth. So if I select Spectrum here and click play, that is the spectrum of my uh, of my little zoom box. And if I zoom out here, I can hold down the X button again to do a crosshair. I can left click and actually move this around, kind of go back in time. Um, so you can imagine if you're looking for a specific signal or trying to do some sort of uh, signal detection based off a of RAID or a cyclostationary function, you know, you can kind of move this around and uh, instead of trying to run some sort of match filter on the whole bandwidth, you can maybe run a match filter on just a little bit of data. Or if you're trying to find a specific audio cut from a speaker, you can just drag around an extraction box and listen to it at all stages. It's really handy down at HF. You can kind of just draw a box and move it around um, to all the different signals and kind of listen to everybody without having to dedicate, um, you know, an actual software tuner like I would have traditionally with, you know, one of these. Um, in, the, in the meantime, I'm still uh, recording. I'm still buffering. Now, I only have so long. Eventually, this is going to scroll all the way up and I'm going to run out of time. But if I want to snap back, I can hit live and that's going to take me back to real time. And that's going to be the most current minute. And I still have that extraction box. It's still telling me where it was at. There it is. Um, I've hit extract. It's saved now. So there are, um, there are a couple more ways to save data. Um, there is a way inside of every options pane of of a, of a spectrum. There is a recorders or recording function. You can click on there and you can do recordings. Um, there is another way within your DVR to save your DVR. Slightly different. So I click the options on my DVR. What you can do is uh, you can actually pause this. This is pausing your buffer and what that's going to do is it's that is pausing it. Um, you'll notice my right disc went down to zero. If I click start again, it's going to go back up, but I'm going to have a black spot here, and that's because I, I had turned off the buffer at that time. Now, if I hit pause again, uh, I do have a save button up here, and what I can do is I can say, all right, take this entire DVR file and move it to permanently move it to disk. I can also do some clever things such as... Uh, uh, you know, if I have a, a four hour long buffer, you know, and I have only had my system up for 30 minutes, I can have it only move over data that has, uh, you know, content in it. It's a little bit slower, but it's a little bit more efficient. 
Um, so this can be quite useful if you are out and you don't know how long you're going to be or you're trying to look for something you don't know how long it's going to be. And if you have the storage space, uh, you can just put that file in your recording database. Um, like for example, if I uh, say move entire file and replace it, um, I'm going to save. If I go back to my recording directory, Here, and it tagged it as well with the session tags. Uh, it's a slightly different, it says DVR. And the reason why that's slightly different is that uh, there are associated files with this um, that are kind of hidden. And those are all of your uh, FFT, etc. cetera, static. And, and you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. So, you know, here is a giant waterfall plot of that 10 minutes. Um, you know, all those FFTs had been pre-calculated earlier. And I get sort of the same function, not sort of, the same function where I can zoom in, say enhance, and actually see, um, you know, this happen. And it's actually quite, quite neat. Uh, this is a 13-bit Barker code, and you actually see the phase shifts in the frequency domain, which is quite, quite cool. Um, and then the other one was a frequency modulated pulse. You're seeing that LF up there. So that's for the power of the DVR and the power of being able to record that way. And even in a file of a file, you know, in a file, I can draw an extraction box here and cut that. And that's going to make a new file. Um, all of your recording database, your recording database is tied together. So no matter uh, which uh, instance of scepter or uh, parent idea of scepter you're running, you're still, you know, looking at the same recording database. You saw I had another instance of scepter going, I hit record, and it dumped to this file or dumped to this, uh, you know, recording database manager. Um, you can actually set it up to not do that also, uh, but as by default, that is something that is there. Um, so I'm sure I missed something. My, my uh, DVR is turned off. Turn, close that. Um, like I said, there's a, a plethora of ways with which to do recordings. You can also turn on and off recordings via the API. Um, we talked about recordings from, you know, the upper right hand side, uh, from the, you know, the options pane of the spectrum. Uh, the control panel has the ability to do recordings as well. The, um, you know, overarching recorders is another place that you can actually do recordings. And, um, you know, even inside of there, there's the ability to make that customizable by, um, you know, syncing displays and, uh, and or syncing recordings rather, um, as well as assigning pre-buffers, which is slightly, you know, different than the DVR. And there's also something I didn't even talk about at all, which is the auto recorders um, also, which is tied to the auto detect spectrum, which I still need to make a video about. Um, and there's actually even yet another way to do a recording. I, I can't show you with this display because, uh, it's dependent on having an actual receiver connected. And that is when you are setting up a scan file to step on certain frequencies, you can have it record for a certain duration based off of detection of a, of a signal or not. Um, now that's not a detection of a specific type of signal. That's just going to be a threshold based. If there's energy detected, it will actually cut a file. So anyways, a lot of different ways to do recording inside of Scepter. Um, I'm sure I missed one or two, but uh, um, any comments, questions, concerns, you know, feel free to email us at info at 3dblabs.com or 3db-labs.com. Um, more than happy to answer any questions you have. All right, thanks.